I want everybody just to stretch their arms first of all. Wake up. I know don't drop your, your food in your lab or anything. That's good. How many people in the audience have taken care of somebody who had a cold related injury? Okay. How many people in the audience have heard of using thrombolytics as a potential treatment for frostbite? Okay, we have the largest experience in the world with that technology. It does have some limitations, but I hope maybe you'll get an understanding of how it can be used in selected patients and uh, in a few cases, it allows us to uh, salvage some otherwise non-salvageable digits. Ice forms outside in Minnesota when it rains and it's cold. Uh, if it gets really cold, ice can form inside the human body as well. And when that does, there's a whole lot of things that happen. But people who get frostbite are also at risk for having systemic hypothermia. And if you work in the emergency room or if you see patients with acute injuries, the most important thing, if you have somebody who presents with a cold injury or with frostbite, is to get their core temperature. And the reason is, nobody dies of frostbite, but every year a lot of people die of hypothermia. Be glad you're not in Central Europe right now. They lost 78 people this week from, from cold-related injuries already, and they're still counting bodies. So um, Alaska apparently had 15 feet of snow already this year. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We're, the rest of the world is getting what we're missing for our winter right now. But systemic hypothermia can kill people. Local cold injury has a whole lot of terms associated with it. The generic term that we use all the time is frostbite, and I would encourage you to use it in a very specific subset of patients who have a local cold injury because the mechanism of how they got cold and how cold they got actually determines their outcome. And we're going to talk about why that's significant. So who gets injured? Well, in Minnesota, we all grow up knowing that when it's cold outside, you can get hurt, you can get in trouble. That's not true of other places in the country. We have a lot of people who move here from the south who really don't realize how dangerous cold can be because they've never experienced it. But in general in Minnesota, we see a lot of people who have problems with alcohol or other drugs and they make poor choices. Or maybe they just have mental illness or they're demented and they can't recognize the fact that they're in a situation that could hurt them. The elderly, particularly if they fall in the winter, can get cold injuries very quickly. And patients who are insensate, if you're sitting in a wheelchair or if you're wearing braces, and we've seen two young women who had braces on their legs, where the, the heat was carried away by the cold metal of the brace and they got a localized cold contact injury just from the brace. Um, and then there's the people, that, as I said, move here that uh, just don't knew, know about cold climates. Luckily, we're not in a war zone because the highest rate of cold-related injuries ever reported in modern history was during the Bosnian conflict when civilians were deprived of fuel. And the civilian uh, frostbite rate was just phenomenal. Unfortunately, I don't have a remote that allows me to stand out front here. Uh, cold injuries have changed the course of history. Hannibal crossed the Alps twice during the Second Punic Wars, 219 to 217 BC, the first time he came through a pass um, with an army of about 50,000 men. Uh, when he had a retreat in the dead of winter, uh, he lost 20,000 of 46,000 men in 15 days. Napoleon, in the summer of 1812, set off to invade Russia with 250,000 men under arms and another 250,000 camp followers. One year later, he retreated with 350 men who could still carry their own rifles. In World War II, the U.S. lost 90,000 men, 60,000 in the Battle of the Bulge, and the number who died on the Eastern Front after Germany invaded Russia is undocumented. We know it's millions of people, both combatants and civilians. Um, it happened to be the coldest winter of that century that, that Hitler decided to invade Russia, a big mistake. During the Korean War, 10% of all U.S. casualties were due to cold weather injuries, and we had the finest cold weather gear ever known in the history of man at the time. So, Systemic hypothermia has some pretty profound effects. We define this arbitrarily with a thermometer. We say, okay, we're going to say that your core temperature is 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's going to be mild. I can tell you if you've ever been that cold, it doesn't feel mild. It is miserable. But by the time you get down to 85 to 90, it's moderate, and it gets severe below 85. This is an arbitrary classification. There's nothing that says that, that when you switch from 90 to 91 that you miraculously change your, your physiologic status. 
symptomatically what we see when these patients present is initially they are cold, they're uncomfortable, they're shivering, and they get confused very easily. They have a hard time carrying on a conversation. As they get colder, they stop shivering, they become somnolent, they become combative, and if you get their vital signs, you'll notice that they have a very slow heart rate. They are bradycardic across the board. As they get colder, they will actually stop responding, they become comatose, they get bradyarrhythmias, and finally, asystolic arrest. Now, asystolic arrest does not mean they're dead. Under ideal control conditions, under general anesthesia at the University of Minnesota in 1956, they started doing open heart surgery by taking people who were anesthetized, putting them in a horse tank with ice, cooling their core temperature down to 15 degrees centigrade, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. The heart would stop, they'd put them on the table, prep them, open the chest, operate on an asystolic heart for up to 30 minutes, close the chest, rewarm them, and the patients would survive in many cases. Not everybody survived. But that's under ideal conditions where you're monitoring their vital signs, or giving them fluid, and so forth. So just because the patient comes in without signs of life doesn't automatically mean they're dead. And the old dictum was, you're not dead until you're warm and dead if you come cold. The practical reality is that there's a lot of people in Minnesota who die shoveling snow or trying to push a car or something like that. It's unwitnessed. They're found in a snowbank. They're cold. They're dead because they died, and then they got cold. So you can spend lots and lots of time rewarming cold patients who will not <coughs> survive. And that's a dilemma that I can't answer for you. You can't you know, see somebody who comes in and they seem to have no signs of life and make that split decision, split second decision, is this person salvageable or not? That's a clinical decision that I can't give you a lot of guidance with. So, cardiac arrest occurs, the temperature continues to drop in an awake patient. Now this is, this is something that we have to be aware of. Patients who come in cold are not uniformly cold. We know their core temperature, but I can guarantee you their extremities are colder. Why? Because as you get cold, you have a reflex vasoconstriction, and you stop perfusing your skin, almost. If it actually freezes, you do stop perfusing your skin. And so the skin temperature may be around the freezing point and your core temperature may still be in the 70s or 80s or 90s. So as you go to warm this patient up, you cause vasodilatation of the skin, that's a reflex. And you can have the blood that's coming into that skin give up its heat to the tissue, and when it returns to the heart, it's colder than when it left the heart. And so you can actually have a phenomenon, the term is called, as you'll see in the literature, it's called after drop, it's a terrible term. But what it means is you can watch the patient who comes in with a core temperature of 90, as you start to warm them, drop down to 86. And that patient can actually arrest on you after they get to the hospital. So that's a problem that you have to be aware of. The other thing is that every patient who is cold has by definition a coagulopathy. It has nothing to do with the levels of the, of the coagulation factors in the blood, which is all we can measure with coag tests. So if you draw a blood tube and you send it off for coags in a patient who's cold, it'll come back and it'll say, oh yeah, the times are normal, the INR is normal, and so forth. And the reason is that every blood tube of every patient, after it leaves the, the ward or the ER, goes to the lab and it's room temperature. So what do they do? They put it on a nice plate and they warm it up and then they do their, their times. That's not the clinical situation. There's a, something called Arrhenius' law. Arrhenius' law says, if you have chemicals that are going to react, the rate at which they react is determined by their temperature. It's almost linear over a, a wide temperature range, particularly in biologic systems. And as you drop the temperature of your reactants as you get cold, the ability of your coagulation cascade to be activated slows down, probably about 10% for a two degree centigrade temperature drop. Because coagulation cascade is a multiple step process, 10, 15 steps, depending on who you believe. And each one of those is slowed down a little bit. By the time you get to a core temperature that's 35 degrees, you have a patient in the operating room who is a disaster waiting to happen. And, and when I'm doing burn excisions, I stop if the patient's core temperature gets to 36 degrees. And the reason is, I know that if they get any colder than that, they're gonna start not stop bleeding while I'm trying to remove their dead skin. So, these patients have to be carefully evaluated for the possibility that they might have some minor trauma 
and yet significant breathing either at the scene or internally after they get here. And then finally, there's a, there's a whole separate issue we're not going to talk about today, and that's cold water drowning. And you see about, this is probably the, the topic that comes up most frequently on the news, is that some kid's out walking on the ice and he goes in, and he goes under the ice. And if you're an adult, that's usually a fatal event very quickly. And the reason is that your glottis opens. In Minnesota, when you inhale water, it's fresh water. And in your lungs, this water will cross the alveoli into your bloodstream very, very quickly. Your serum osmolarity will drop to about 200. You'll lyse all your red cells, and that's a fatal event. Those patients are not coming back. In kids, sometimes, and it isn't 100% of the time, they'll close their glottis. This is called the diving reflex. And if you close your glottis, you trap air in your lungs, which is a good thing because it excludes water. More importantly, kids have a small mass for their surface area so they can cool themselves, particularly their brain, extremely rapidly in freezing water. If that happens, it is possible that they can be under the ice for a period of time, 20, 30, 40, sometimes longer, minutes, and when they're pulled out, they're floppy, they're unresponsive, they may or may not have a, a, a palpable pulse, but under ideal circumstances can be resuscitated and have neurologic function that en enables them to go to school and so forth. Now, if you look at the data, that time is a relatively short period of time that, that they can survive. There are patients up to 30 minutes who have been under the ice who have been neurologically normal. But if you look at patients who survived after being under the ice for 45 minutes, those survivors, and it's only a small percentage, all of them are in custodial care with severe neurologic impairment. So just because you went in the ice and you got pulled out and you got resuscitated doesn't mean that you're going to be neurologically normal. But there is that, that window of opportunity if you get them out quickly. So that's a whole separate issue we're not going to talk about. The other thing that's, that's confusing is that the patients will often present in disarray. They may look like they're victims of violence, sexual, sexual assault, they're found naked outside in Minnesota winter. That doesn't make any sense, right? Well, this is a phenomenon that endlessly repeats in patients who get cold, and that is they get so confused that they start to undress, or they'll run away from help, but more commonly they'll just start to undress. And there's a reason for that, I believe. It's not found in a textbook as a, a physiologic explanation, but here's what I think happens. There is something that is well documented called the hunting reflex, and that is every four to five minutes, if you're an Eskimo or an Inuit Indian in northern Canada, and every seven to eight minutes, if you're a Caucasian living in Minnesota, if you get your hands cold, the, the, the massive vasoconstriction will relent for about 45 seconds and you'll get a pulse of warm blood that flows back into your cold digits. That's a protective mechanism to keep you from freezing your fingers. It isn't 100% effective, but it's what we're born with, okay? The problem is that when you cool your skin, your temperature sense to change, change receptors, which is what we have on our skin. We don't have thermometers in our skin. We have sensors that detect changes in temperature. Their set point gets set to a lower temperature. So that then when that warm blood rushes back into the hand, the hand feels like it's hot. As a matter of fact, it feels like it's on fire because it's going from a temperature that may be near freezing up to 37 degrees centigrade. The result is that this confused patient all of a sudden feels hot all over and starts undressing. And to show you that it's not unique to Minnesota, the two most experienced climbers who died in 1998 and the disaster on Everest when there was this big catastrophe, um, were found at 23,000 feet. They were, they were both Japanese climbers who'd been climbing for 30 years each, were found undressed and dead, frozen solid. Um, and the reason is they got hypothermic. They had the best cold weather gear you could buy and they got confused and they undressed and they died. Um, it also happens to, to ocean swimmers. This is most commonly reported in people who try to swim the English Channel. Um, Michael Osterholm, which was the state epidemiologist for many years, tried twice to swim the, swim the English Channel both times. He ended up <coughs> swimming in circles around the boat, telling everybody what great time he was making, and he had no clue that he wasn't making any headway at all. He had to be pulled out of the water forcibly. So, 
this confusion is an ongoing problem. These patients may be very combative, and the first reaction is, oh, this patient's psychotic, they're drunk, they're intoxicated, they're on drugs, and it may be just that they're cold. So what, what do we do for these patients when they've got hypothermia? Well, obviously the first thing is to remove them from the cold environment and then get their cold clothing off, not the other way around, and begin rehydration with warm fluids. And this is the take-home message that I would ask you to remember out of this talk, out of everything I'm going to tell you today, and that is that patients who come in hypothermic, by definition, are hypovolemic, and there's a physiologic reason for it. When you have a perfusing blood pressure, you can push fluid across your glomerulus into your loop of Henle. But as you get cold, your ability to concentrate that urine decreases. That chemical reaction, that physiologic process slows down. And so you make an ultrafiltrate like crazy. And all patients who have hypothermia come in peeing like normal folks. And they are massively hypovolemic. And if you don't treat that, they can rest on you as they start to grow. And that actually happened in the burn unit um, within the last decade. The patient was seen in the emergency room. Um, it was cold. Ben is sitting in his car for a couple of days. Came up to the burn unit, and his IVs were TKO because he was making great urine. And so, plopped him in the tub, and he rested. We didn't get him back. We got it. Now, here's the, the flip side of this. If you try and put a central catheter in these patients to measure their CVP, which seems like a normal thing to do, one, it's hard to get in because their volume contracted, and two, if that guide wire touches the myocardium, that myocardium is unbelievably sensitive and will flip almost instantaneously into ventricular fibrillation. That's a bad thing because the cold myocardium does not respond to defibrillation like a warm myocardium does. And now you're stuck with a patient and you're doing CPR and you've got to get that heart warm if you're going to get them back. And most of those patients, if you're going to get them back, you're going to have to crack the chest, open the pericardium, lavage the heart, open cardiac massage, and then do direct cardioversion. And that's the only patient that I know of that's <coughs> likely to require that um, in, in Minnesota. So please, just don't look at the urine volume as a measure of how well they're doing physiologically. Give them that fluid immediately. Um, we measure core temperature reliably with a Foley that's tipped with a thermistor <coughs> machine. Um, that gives you a real time temperature that you can believe. Um, there are people who've done rectal thermometers, usually they pop out and end up measuring the temperature of the bed, or worse yet, you stick it in the stool, you know, know what the temperature of the stool is and not the patient. Um, so we really are big believers that these temperature thermistors on Foley's are really helpful. They give you a reliable temperature. And when we're warming our patients, we can actually watch the temperature rise and fall as we do to various manipulations. Cardiac monitor is important because these patients have radiorrhythmias. And for frostbite, we want to keep the frozen parts frozen. Now that's, that's a little bit counterintuitive. But what we've learned is that if you have somebody who's hypothermic and you miss the diagnosis, and you start warming their extremities, their temperature will drop and you may actually lose them right in the emergency department. And that's an avoidable problem. So how are we gonna rewarm them? Well, there's lots of options. The, the way I was taught in medical school was we were gonna do pearl or peritoneal lavage or maybe even gastric rectal or bladder lavage. All those things are tried. Um, you can calculate the amount of energy that you can add to a person's body if you have a liter of saline at 40 degrees centigrade. If it's hotter than that, you're likely to cook the blood if you put it intravenously or you know, damage the peritoneal cavity if you're giving it um, a peritoneal lavage. So there's about three degrees of temperature that that, that, that that fluid can drop to get to your core temperature of 37 degrees, which is your goal. So in a bag of, of IV fluid at 40 degrees centigrade, you can get about 3,000 calories maybe into the patient if it's a 100% efficient system. If you calculate their, their temperature, their heat deficit, it's fairly easy to do. Um, you take the body mass, you, measure, you multiply it times uh, 0 0.86, which is the average specific heat of your body in calories per gram. And then you figure out what their core temperature is and use that as an estimate of what their deficit is. 
And you'll find that a patient who's a 70 kilogram man who's got a, a body mass or a, a body temperature of say 30 degrees centigrade um, has about a uh, 280,000 calorie deficit. Okay, you're not going to get that back very quickly by using pleural repair at Neil Lavage. On the other hand, if you have access to a whirlpool and there are no contraindications to immersion, the whirlpool upstairs in a burn center, for example, um, 250 liter tank has, uh, it's not right, it's a 250 gallon tank, has about uh, 1.3 million calories if it drops from 40 degrees centigrade to 37 degrees centigrade that it can give up to warm up the body. So you have a, a huge heat reservoir that you can transfer very efficiently by convection in the tub if you put them in a whirlpool. Now there are some contraindications to that. You can't do it if they're getting CPR. You can't do it if the patient has to be in the OR. You can't do it if they have unstable fractures or undiagnosed spine fractures. Um, we have done it in patients who are intubated. Uh, it isn't much fun, but it does work. And when we warm them, we warm the trunk first to keep the extremities out and watch their temperature start to rise. When it gets up to a reasonable level, I can't tell you what magic number that is. I typically use about 35 degrees centigrade. We'll dump one arm and watch the temperature drop. And then in real time, we'll watch it come back up slowly, and then we'll dunk another arm. So how that out, it's frozen. Now, this is not a knee-jerk reflex. Patients who are hypothermic do not automatically get sent up to the burn center. The trauma team has to see them, evaluate them, make sure they don't have missed injuries, and then we'll figure out a way to try and help you guys get these people rewarmed. There is an alternative, and that is <coughs> cardiopulmonary bypass. Anybody ever put somebody on cardiopulmonary bypass for hypothermia? I've done it once. Um, it isn't much fun. You have to call on the team, you have to go to everybody there, and everybody's worried about giving the patient heparin, and it's, it's a real zoo. There are good data from other hospitals showing that it's very efficient, and there are anecdotal data to suggest that if you have frozen extremities, that you may have a less severe frostbite injury outcome afterwards because you're thawing from the inside out. <coughs> the problem with external heat is that as we warm the frozen tissue, if the tissue is not perfused, we're speeding up, up its metabolism and not meeting those metabolic needs. So you may actually cause an injury to the tissue while you're trying to rewarm them. That is minimized if you do what we call rapid rewarming, which is immersion in 104 degree Fahrenheit or 37 degrees centigrade water. But um, anecdotally, the data would suggest that if you can warm them from the inside out, you're changing the temperature and speeding up the metabolism at the same time as you're delivering the, the oxygen and glucose that the tissue needs, and there's even less severe injury. So something to think about. So what about if the patient's really, really in trouble? Well, if they have any perfusing rhythm, I don't care if their heart rate's 20, if they have a perfusing rhythm, please do not do CPR. There are good reports showing that if you do that, you can easily flip that heart into ventricular fibrillation, and then you're stuck. What do they need? They need to be rewarmed. They need that volume expansion. Um, pressors are a good idea, although patients don't respond very well to, to pressors when they're cold. It's still a good idea. And then you can consider AV shunting. Um, and if you're going to try and defibrillate them, which is a good idea, obviously, um, typically we would we continue CPR at least until they're 90 degrees. I've, I've actually used 92 in the past. And if you can't get them back at 92, you're probably not going to get them back. They may have died of other parts before they got cold. Any questions about hypothermia? Anybody still awake? No questions? Yes? Here's, here's the story. <laughs> your temperature change sensors in your body respond more intensively the faster you change the temperature. So if you get your, your skin cold enough, you reset your skin temperature. As a matter of fact, your skin does literally get numb. There are good physiologic studies documenting this very well. But when you warm them, what you're doing is you're maximally stimulating those temperature change sensors if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw a diagram, but I'm not going to put this screen up right now. And the response is that you feel like you're on fire. So the patients who are being rewarmed will scream and yell at you. It's not that they're crazy. It's not that they're seeking drugs. It's not that they're drunk. It is a normal physiologic response. You can prove this for yourself. 
in the winter time, not this one maybe, but in the winter time, go out, shovel snow, um, get the mail, uh, try and start your car, and you'll have some unprotected part of your body that gets cold, and it's it you come in and it's white and kind of tingles. Get in a hot shower. I've done this, and if you get in a hot shower, the hot shower on your on your trunk feels just wonderful. And when that same temperature water hits your hands, it feels like your hands are on fire. That's what the patient is experiencing. So we use narcotics. And it's it's a tightrope because you've got somebody who may be disoriented or confused and you're trying to give them narcotics, well, they're going to stop breathing. Obviously, if the patient comes in and they can't protect their airway, you have to intubate them. Be aware that there are documented cases of patients who got intubated because they were hypothermic. And apparently, the vagal stimulation of being intubated caused them to have intricate fibrillation. That's something you can't avoid. You have to protect their airway, period. Good questions. Other questions? Shivering. Shivering. Um, shivering is a very inefficient way of generating heat. It produces a lots of lactic <coughs> acid, so the patients will actually come in um, acidotic. Um, but it is the mechanism we are born with to help raise your temperature quickly. Um, it will very quickly deplete your glucose stores and eventually your glycogen stores. This is particularly a problem in kids. Remember, young kids don't store very much glycogen in their livers, so it's a good idea to give them glucose. Um, but if you're cold enough, you won't shiver at all. And as you start to warm up, you will shiver more and more. That's a sign actually you're getting better. Um, pretty miserable feeling, but it's... It's a sign that you're actually getting up to a, a mild hypothermic state from a moderate or severe hypothermic state. Other questions? Okay, let's talk about local cold injury. This is the real air temperature outside my house in January of 1991. That's minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not the wind chill, that's the real air temperature. So, it turns out that some animals can tolerate being apparently frozen solid. Gray tree frog is an example. What happens with gray tree frogs? Well, in the summertime, they're running around and hopping and looking like this. And in the wintertime, they dig into the banks of the stream beds. And if you dig them out, they look like little hockey pucks. And you could probably play <laughs> hockey with them if you wanted to, but it wouldn't do them very much good. But they truly have no signs of life. And if you look at their insides, I wish I had a better remote here you find that they have ice crystals everywhere in their bodies. So why aren't they dead? Well, they have a unique adaptation where they use glucose as a way of having, preventing the ice crystals from forming too large and in certain tissues from forming at all so that they protect their brains and their other vital structures. Now, you and I can't do that, but it is a unique adaptation. However, human skin is kind of an interesting tissue. Under idealized conditions, it can be cryopreserved. You can take harvested human skin, freeze it under very controlled conditions to minimize the size of the ice crystals, which means very, very slow freezing, emphasize slow freezing, to down to minus 30, I'm sorry, minus 70 degrees centigrade. It will remain viable for up to 10 years. This is the cadaver allocraft that we've been using in the burn center for. 30, 40 years. Yeah. It's frozen human tissue. Slow cooling with formation of very small ice crystals is crucial if this tissue is going to remain viable. And rapid freezing destroys the sin cells. And the reason is with rapid freezing, what happens is ice crystals form intracellularly, extracellularly, intravascularly. And ice has a larger volume than the equivalent amount of water. The larger volume means that it puts incredible <laughs> pressure on the cell membrane as that ice crystal forms. It actually pushes on the cell from the inside out. And ice is pointy, and so it punctures the cell. Punctured cells are dead. We're not going to get those back magically. So rapid freezing is a bad thing. Occasionally, frozen digits can survive if treated with some interventions we're going to talk about. So this is the Ehrenholtz classification of cold injuries. You don't have to memorize it, but it is published. And if you look at tissue that does not freeze, and you have very rapid cooling, um, that happens to just about everybody in Minnesota in the wintertime. And you go outside and you're shoveling the snow or you're trying to start your car and you come in and your ears are white and they're tingling and you warm them up and they hurt like crazy for a few minutes and they're pink. It has no clinical significance unless you keep doing it. 
And if you keep doing it, you can get a condition called chill blains, or in the military it was called cold immersion foot in Europe during World War II and in Korea. And what that means is you, you keep repeating the process and then you get a physiologic change in the tissue. And the change to the skin is called perneal. If you're a dermatologist, you know this already. And perneal is a redness and scaling of skin that's been multiply injured with cold. More importantly, patients who get chill blains have a profound Reynolds phenomenon where they get unbelievable vasoconstriction in response to any cold exposure. And it's really painful. And it predisposes them to other injuries because their, their tissue gets numb easily and so they'll get trauma or they may even freeze it easily because they think it's so cold so quickly. On the other hand, if you have tissue freezing, if it occurs very quickly, the term that I've tried to ask people to start using is flash freeze injury or cold contact injury. And we're trying to differentiate that from the frostbite injury where there's very slow cooling, which may have temporarily cryopreserved some of the tissue which might be salvageable. So this is the, the box. So you've got no ice, frost knit, chill lines, ice forming, really fast uh, cooling, which gives uh, large ice crystals would either be a flash freeze injury or a cold contact injury and then frostbite, slow cooling. Be aware that the same patient may have two or three or four of these conditions simultaneously in adjacent body parts, depending upon how that particular body part got cold and how long it stayed cold. So this is a, a little diagram taken from Scientific American in 1990. And what it shows is a normal cell. And then you have ice that starts to form in the extracellular fluid. And under cold conditions, the ice will preferentially form in the extracellular fluid because it has the lowest concentration of proteins compared to intracellular fluid or blood, which is intervascular fluid, right? So as ice forms in the extracellular fluid, that's pure water, and it leaves behind concentrated solutes. <clears throat> that high osmolarity solution now surrounding the cells causes water to move from the cells into the extracellular space, and the cells deflate and get kind of floppy and boggy. And then, as the ice crystals slowly grow, perhaps you won't puncture those cells. But more commonly, if it freezes quickly, you see rapid formation of these ice crystals either in extracellular fluid or intracellularly and ruptures them. And here's a clinical example. Um, this is a kid, he's uh, 18 years old, he's in college, and he's gonna tap a keg with a CO2 container. Don't ask me what YouTube video he saw, I don't know. I can tell you that his buddy was sitting on the other side and got an identical injury in a mirror uh, image position. And this is a month later. Now what's unique about cold injury is it can kill tissue, but unlike um, heat, it does not, not denature your protein. And that's clinically significant because denatured protein is a place where bacteria loves to grow. So if you have a thermal burn, we typically use topical antimicrobials always because that cooked tissue allows bacteria to grow like crazy. The risk of infection is huge, all right, if you don't, if you don't keep it covered. On the other hand, if you have a cold injury, the tissue's dead, but the protein is not denatured, bacteria have a hard time growing that. It isn't that you can't get it infected, but the risk is low. And this is what it looks like a month later. That looks like a dead heart scab. And it's literally dead, desiccated, dry tissue that's sitting on there, and we're going to excise that and put a skin graft on. Okay? That's a flash freeze injury from escaping gas. This was liquid CO2 that sprayed the thigh. And that temperature dropped below freezing in tenths of a second. Um, cold contact injuries are more common. It happens when people walk around um, in their bare feet or stocking feet in the winter time or whatever. And usually it's contact with a cold surface or possibly with a cold object. Exposure takes minutes rather than seconds and the tissue dies in the areas of contact. So here's a patient who comes in and he's lost his shoe running from police and of course now he's got a frozen spot on his foot. Um, this is actually after it's thawed and he's got a blister and he comes in to see us and finally decided that he couldn't walk because it hurt too much, so they wanted some treatment for it. And the one thing that's obvious to me from this picture is that I cannot tell you what tissue will survive and what tissue will die based on the way the patient looks when they first come in, ever. And anybody who tells you that they can is probably just blowing smoke. There's lots and lots of papers 
that are published about frostbite and cold contact injury that say, oh yes, well we saw this patient, he obviously was going to lose this tissue, so we treated him and it got better, therefore this treatment works. It's bad science is the best I can say. So what I can tell you is that this looked pretty good when I saw him initially. It doesn't look so good over here. And under this blister, I can't tell you what was going to happen, but this is a month later, and look at how much of that is healed. Now this needs to be excised and grafted, but this is not a frostbite injury. This is a cold contact injury, and these cells were dead back here. It wasn't an evolving process like frostbite can be. So let's talk a little bit about frostbite. Now frostbite occurs under conditions of slow cooling, where you get this small ice crystal formation in the extracellular fluid. The cells give up some of their water to the extracellular fluid and, and kind of deflate, get floppy. And while this is going on, you have intense vasoconstriction as the patient gets cold. So there's poor inflow of blood, which limits the amount of heat being delivered. And the cell metabolism is slowing down. And this is really crucial. Slowing cell metabolism allows the cells a little bit better chance of survival. At about 27 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll start to see ice crystals in the extracellular fluid. That's the freezing point of seawater and also the freezing point of our extracellular fluid. And the water moves out the cells. And as the blood flow continues to slow down, eventually it will completely stop. Now, when you have no blood flow, that's not a good thing. So the timer is running. You have tissue that is at its lowest possible metabolic rate, but still it's not getting any oxygen, it's not getting any glucose. And it isn't happy. It isn't. It isn't going to be like uh, having it in a an ultra cold freezer as cryopreserved skin. This tissue is is at risk for for being irreversibly injured. We showed you the diagram before. Where now we have this state up here. So here's somebody who's frozen, and he says, "I can't feel my foot." That's what he says. He says. I know I get cold and I can't feel it. And it's white and it looks insensate. It looks stiff. It isn't because it's a solid block of ice like an ice cube. Um, it turns out that human fat, as it gets cold, gets about the consistency of Crisco. And so the whole, the whole extremity starts to feel pretty rigid. Um, and this is immediately after being immersed in warm water for 30 minutes. So what's going to happen with this foot? And I will tell you again, I don't know. <coughs> Typically what will happen is if there's been a significant injury to this foot, is that after it's thawed, it will blister. And that blister formation takes a period of time. Because blisters don't form because fluid moved from down deep in the foot out into the junction between the epidermis and the dermis, which by the way is where blisters form. What happens is that after this goes from no blood flow to here where it's obviously pink and has great capillary refill, then there's a difference between what goes in and what comes out of that foot. And the difference leaks out across that injured capillary bed and into the extracellular space and then migrates up to the dermal epidermal junction and you get these gigantic bulli, I mean big buggers. And the presence of bulli indicates that at least at some point after the tissue thawed, that tissue was perfused. So we have learned, both experimentally and clinically, that rapid rewarming gives you the best chance of salvaging tissue if you do nothing else. Okay, so if the patient goes and uh, sleeps it off after freezing tissue because they got drunk and they're outside and throws their feet and go to bed and wake up the next day, that tissue is very slowly rewarmed. We know that there's a, a a greater risk of losing tissue in those patients, and it also works in experimental animals. So what we think is that the cellular metabolism is speeding up and the blood flow will respond very quickly if you do rapid rewarming so we can minimize our tissue injury. But the problem is the data show 40% of patients who have a cold injury, a local cold injury, frostbite, will have thawed before they come to the emergency department. So we've lost that window of opportunity of helping that subset of patients. If the patient does show up and they're frozen, uh, we want to treat systemic hypothermia first, rapidly rewarm the body part in 140 degree Fahrenheit water, give them narcotics. And then this is the protocol that's been published since about 1986, I think. Uh, we give them ibuprofen by mouth. It has a couple of benefits. It does have some mild pain relief. Um, it also is an anti-prostaglandin agent. And when we measured blister fluid um, 
cytokine levels years ago we found it was very high in thromboxane and PG2 and some other vasoactive agents. So we thought that maybe ibuprofen would have some benefits there. Um, there was a group from Florida who, who uh, advocated topical aloe vera gel. Now, why anybody in Florida thought they knew how to take care of frostbite, I don't know. Uh, we tried it, didn't seem to do anything, we gave it up. We do do elevation, aspiration, the skin ball, and padded footwear. So that's the, the old standard um, conservative treatment used worldwide for frostbite. Physiologically, what we think is happening is after you rewarm that tissue, initially the blood vessels vasodilate, so you get blood flow coming in. But the problem is there's three tissues in your body that your body that do not tolerate being frozen, one of which is endothelial cells, the lining of your arterioles. And those endothelial cells, which start out nice and flat, stuck on the basement membrane, now turn into little bowling balls, tear off the basement membrane, and embolize into the capillary bed. They're bigger than your erythrocytes. And what you have now is a loss of forward flow and a thrombogenic surface left behind, and you get progressive proximal thrombosis that occurs over a period of time. The ischemic skin then develops bullae within a few hours and the nail beds become dark. So here's a kid who's got a relatively superficial frostbite. He was waiting for the bus, came in, uh, used to live in Texas and he didn't realize that when his ears got cold that it was a problem. When they stopped hurting, he sort of ignored it, got on the bus, went to school, got his ears and they hurt again. And then when he got the, the bullae, they sent him to my clinic. And here he's got a, a blister here, but it's popped and it's got relatively clear fluid in it. And uh, that actually has a fairly good prognosis for his healing. Here's another guy who um, was drinking, fell asleep in a doorway in the middle of winter, 1992, woke up, stumbled to the flop house, went to sleep. The next morning, woke up, his hands looked like this, and he came to us. And the first thing he said is, what's going to happen to my hands? And I, I told him what I'm telling you, and that is, I don't know. Even to this day, I cannot look at that picture and tell you what's going to happen with his fingers. And it's not just a skin color, I just don't know. I can tell you that he's not got much for bullae here, and he's got tense bullae here, and they are hemorrhagic. Now, if you have hemorrhagic bullae, it means you've got pretty severe damage to your capillary bed. You're actually leaking red cells up into your, into your dermal junction, so that's a bad thing. But if you're not perfused down here, you're not going to make bullae, because there's no blood flow to dump its excess fluid into that injured tissue. This is what he looks like at one week. This is what he looks like at two weeks. He's already got penciling and mummification of this index finger. He's got full thickness loss down the bone here, 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 and here, and that tissue was amputated. And even to this day, going back here, I can't tell you what he was going to lose. I can tell you that having proximal bullae that are hemorrhagic is not a good thing, but that doesn't tell me anything about exactly what he's going to lose. So. After they thawed and had a chance for the boli to form or not form, there's some good prognostic signs. The presence of sensation, erythema, warm digits, and if you have boli having clear blebs is a good thing. On the other hand, at 24 or 48 hours, the absence of sensation signs of cool digits, hemorrhagic blebs, which don't reach the tips, or even worse yet, purple <coughs> skin, which never blisters, seems to even be a worse prognosis. We'll talk about that at the end of the talk. So here's a classification system that's probably applicable at a month after your injury, and that is, well, it was red, okay, that's, that's first degree, and it, if it had blisters but it healed without grafting, well, that's second degree, and if we had some skin loss but we need to do a skin graft, well, that's third degree, and if it's down to bone, well, that's fourth degree. But that doesn't give you any real-time information that's going to help you manage the patient <coughs> after the fact. Here are therapies that have been studied in very well-designed prospective trials which have not been successful in changing the outcome of frostbite. And initially the thought was that, geez, you know, we can see this poor perfusion. Maybe it's reflex vasospasm that's causing it after they thaw, so we better do a surgical sympathectomy or give them reserpine to block the sympathetic response or whatever, and none of these things worked. So we have looked at a bunch of different lytic agents to try and break up the clot that has formed, and here are the things that are on the market, or at least have been on the market. Urokinase, we used initially, got great response, it went off the market, now it's back on the market, it's very expensive. Streptokinase was on the market, it's been pulled off the market. There are three variants of TPA right now. Um, we use whatever the hospital stocks for the stroke victims and the cardiac, uh, myocardial infarction victims. Whatever's available is what we use. We usually combine it with papaverin, 
as well to increase the vasodilatation and increase the drug delivery. And we do catheter-directed infusions. Now this is um, something that my partner Lynn Solom started before I came here in 1982. Uh, I shouldn't say that. He was interested in before I came here in 1982. And in 1985, we actually decided that we were going to study this because we knew that clinically we couldn't look at our patients and say, we're going to lose this, so if we treat it and it survives, we know we had a good response. We decided to look at the perfusion in real time and then decide if we're going to treat this and then look for a response. And so this is sort of a unique study that's been done at this hospital. We do an angiogram if it looks like they have poor tissue perfusion after they thaw, and there's sort of a window of opportunity here. Um, we don't take every patient who's got a local cold injury and send them off to the angiogram suite. For one thing, it takes a while for these physiologic changes to occur after they've thawed. You have to get your, your embolization of your um, endothelial cells. There has to be an impairment of blood flow. You have to get some boli. Because we're not going to spend a lot of money just Im imaging everybody who's got uh, a local cold injury. It's not cost effective. If they have filling defects, then we give a lytic agent and papaverin infusion. We repeat the angiogram at 24 and 48 hours. After 72 hours, we stop regardless of what we're doing. If we do not restore blood flow, we know that that tissue, does, which is not perfused, is going to require amputation for the mummified digits. And I'll show you just a little bit of data from seven patients now. We've looked at 126, 128 patients, of which 66 were treated with lytic agents. We have data on 482 digits which were at risk of being lost because they had perfusion defects on the angiogram. But I'll just show you some, some data for uh, a subset of those. So in seven patients with frostbite, 44 digits had a no vascular blush at, on the initial angiogram, and I'll show you what that means in a second. And then we evaluated their blood flow on completion angiogram and tabulated our late amputation. So here's one of the patients that we studied initially. And he's uh, got drunk and fell and uh, froze his hands, and then he went and slept it off and came to us the next day. And this is what he looks like on presentation. So what's he going to lose? And the answer is, I don't know. I can tell you that this looks more hemorrhagic than that, so maybe this is the worst affected hand. But he's got proximal bullet, you know, distal bullet, his nail beds, which you can't see very well, are pretty, pretty dusky. Uh, but I don't know what he's going to lose. So we did an angiogram. And I'll show you what a normal angiogram looks like first. And what you're going to look for here is the paired digital vessels, ulnar and radial artery, uh, digital vessels, and something called a vascular blush, which is the outline of the soft tissue on the angiogram shown by the uh, perfusion. And just for comparison, this is normal, this is his right hand. <coughs> you can sort of see that he has digital vessels there, but that's about it. Okay, 72 hours later, completion angiogram shows this. Vascular blush, vascular blush, vascular blush, vascular blush blush, a little bit of loss of the outline of the fingertip on the right. Now remember, this was the hand that looked more hemorrhagic, maybe worse, who knows. But here's his other hand. Okay, no visualization of any digital artery. This is his thumb metacarpal, this is or the finger metacarpals here. He has intraarterial clot, visible down here, I didn't point that out on the other angiogram. At 72 hours after the lytic agents, he looks like this. Okay. Vascular blush, 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 blush. Doesn't quite outline that fingertip. Yes. Oh, I thought there was a question. So this is what he looked like on the third day. This is after we stopped his last angiogram. And look at all the hemorrhage into those those bullae. Looks pretty ugly, right? But seven days after his injury, this is what he looks like. Now this guy didn't get off scot free. I've seen him in clinics, and although he lost a little tissue on his fingertips, his index fingertips. He did not require amputations, but what he was complaining of was severe pain on moving his hands. And the reason is, the other two tissues in your body that don't tolerate being frozen are one, bone, and when you freeze bone, the living part of bone dies, but it doesn't matter if that tissue is sur surrounded by living tissue because it will repopulate with osteoblasts and osteoclasts, and it will remodel, and it can survive. But on the ends of your bone, you have the cartilage. If that cartilage is damaged, your body doesn't magically make more cartilage. So this guy ended up with a, an acquired uh, degenerative arthritis of every digit and tremendous pain. Now, the good news is he could still dress himself and feed himself and a few other things, go to the bathroom without assistance. But he paid a penalty for freezing his hands. So these are just some data that I'm going to show you in a, in a diagram here. 
showing that if we get a vascular blush outlining the tips of the digits in 40 and 23 digits, we had no amputations. If we couldn't get that vascular blush back, then we knew we were going to have at least a partial amputation, seven patients out of seven. And honestly, those, those percentages are the same now in the 482 digits that we've evaluated. We're still looking at the same percentages, those that survive and those that don't. So it doesn't magically save every digit. That's the, the take home message. It isn't like just because you've got a frostbite injury, we're automatically going to do lytic agents. It is an expensive intervention. This is just from seven patients, um, data showing the charges for the patient to have this uh, uh, thrombolytic therapy done. It's also risky and has complications associated with it. So what we're missing is the slide here, which shows the huge bullet in the forefoot. But this is a guy who had a frozen foot, thawed, and 20, within 12 hours he had massive bullet across here. He got thrombolytic agents, and this was his outcome. Now this doesn't look like a normal foot to me, but he can walk on it and he didn't have amputations, and he's actually considers himself to be pretty lucky. Now there's some contraindications that we have learned in the process of doing this treatment since 1985. Um, of course, we need somebody who can give us consent. This is an invasive procedure. We aren't going to just take somebody off the street who's disoriented and can't communicate with us and automatically do this. We're going to try and get permission from somebody. In addition, we need a patient who can cooperate. If the patient is disoriented or psychotic and is going to rip out his catheter in bed and bleed to death, we haven't helped him. So we do need to have some degree of cooperation. We have had one child, a five-year-old, in whom we tried this with a catheter that turned out was too big. And we got a proximal clot around the catheter, and the patient had to have an emergency thrombectomy. So we have tried to limit this now, either using more appropriately sized catheters or just not doing this intervention in kids. If you've had trauma or recent surgery and you get thrombolytics, you may spontaneously bleed from those traumatic injuries. So that's a relative contraindication because there is a systemic effect even though we use catheter-directed lytics. The other thing that we've learned the hard way is that if you present 24 hours after being thawed and you've had your big bull eye and you know, all these sorts of things, if that tissue has not been perfused for 24 hours, it's had an irreversible anoxic injury. And giving thrombolytics to dead tissue doesn't make dead tissue alive. So we've given up on those patients. You have to get to us within a, a window of opportunity if we're going to try this intervention. And finally, there is something called a freeze-thaw, refreeze injury where the patient freezes the tissue, thaws it out, freezes it again, and those injured cells, after they thaw, swell up massively. They're in a hypotonic environment, and they swell up, get really, really turgid. And then the first ice crystal that forms after you freeze again ruptures it instantaneously. And those patients, interestingly, never get perfusion of that tissue after they thaw for the final time. They stay purple and have a very distinctive appearance. So here's a guy who uh, came in in January, and I, this is his follow-up visit in, in uh, the clinic a month later, and he got thrombolytics, got a wonderful outcome, but he uh, ran his car into a snowdrift, and he got out and walked a mile, lost his sandals, it was in a blizzard and he was wearing his sandals. Ran his Mercedes, no less, into a snowbank. Got help, got his thrombolytics, got a wonderful outcome. Same day that he came in, this lady came in, and this is a lady unfortunately has Alzheimer's and thinks it's Saturday and it's Friday, so she's going out on the back porch looking for her daughter to come and visit, except she's either barefoot or maybe wearing house slippers, we don't know, she couldn't tell us. And she comes in, and this is what her feet look like when she comes in. So. This is when we were first starting to do this. And in the Hail Mary, we thought, well, we'll see what happens if we give her lytics. She got a little bit of blisters down here after her lytics. No response. This is what she looks like a month later. This is the same day that that other gentleman came in. She came into clinic, and this is what her feet looked like. So just because you've frozen your feet doesn't mean that we're going to be able to salvage them with thrombolytics. After you recover from your frostbite, which is a prolonged period of time, you have digit or extremity amputation if you mummify the tissue, that's pretty obvious, we can't avoid that. We don't do it acutely, by the way, because that, that demarcation will often migrate proximally for several weeks or months. And we found that trying to do early surgery just usually ends up being in two surgeries instead of one. Most patients will have cold intolerance with chronic pain, and joint stiffness or arthritis occurs in at least 50% of patients, depends on the severity. And if you re 
expose your injured tissue to cold, you are likely to get a more severe injury the second time because of respect vasospasm and incomplete healing, I guess, of the tissue. So here's what we're trying to prevent. This is an unfortunate farmer who uh, ran off the road in North Dakota and uh, lost his gloves trying to get to, to help. And this is what he looks like when he comes in. And this is after his amputations. And this is a guy who tries to make a living with his hands. So that's what we're trying to prevent. <coughs> so in the ER, obviously, we want to ask you to check for and treat hypothermia, then rapidly rewarm the frostbitten extremities, monitoring core temperature and the heart rhythm, and then call the burn center, especially if their hemorrhagic blister developed or the tissue appears dusty. We're always willing to consult with you folks and help you manage these patients. But it doesn't mean just because they had a cold injury, they're automatically going to get lytics. We try to be very uh, selective in that response. All right, questions, comments? Time to do 